Sam, would you, for the record, please state your name, birth date, and birthplace? Yes, my name is Samuel J. Slocum. Uh, I was born July the 9th, 1941, and uh, Toppenish, state of Washington, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. Good afternoon. Uh, for the Plainfield Television Group, my name is Jay Vermetti, and I'm pleased to be here to work on the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress, and happy to be here with Sam Slocum from Plainfield, Illinois. Sam, would you, for the record, please state your name, birth date, and birthplace? Yes, my name is Samuel J. Slocum. Uh, I was born July the 9th, 1940. One, and uh, Toppenish, state of Washington, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. And in which war did you serve? I served in the Vietnam conflict. Okay. Uh, which branch of uh, which branch of service? U United States Army, um, artillery. I was in the Fifth uh, Battalion of the Twenty Seventh Artillery, Twenty uh, Third Artillery Group. We went over as a battalion, thirty five hundred to Vietnam in October of 1965. And you have worldly experience from a very early age. Very early. And it, did any of your brothers or sisters uh, serve in the military? Uh, yes. Uh, one brother, my younger brother, uh, 18 months younger than me, Daniel. Uh, uh, I was drafted in 1964, and Daniel was drafted in 1968. And what was it like growing up with, uh, you have um, multiple siblings, mm -hmm. what was it like uh, uh, growing up as a, as a, as a young person, um, balancing all the, you know, mom and dad have their work and they have to take care of uh, these children. And, it, <clears throat> you know, nowadays a lot of families only have one or two children. What was it like growing up in a, in a big family? It was very, very hard. My, my parents, before we left uh, uh, for Hong Kong, and, uh, so I was seven, and uh, I did go to uh, grade school, I think Washington uh, grade school, uh, but um, it was very hard because we, we had no money. Uh, uh, it was, you know, food was hard to come by, uh, and you know, my, my, my father gave up his potential you know, lucrative career for to be a missionary. To be in the missionary. Right. So uh, uh, it was very hard. We were in Hong Kong from 1948 to 1951, and uh, then we were forced out of Hong Kong uh, when the, uh, the the government there somebody issued an, an edict to kill missionaries, and so we were forced to, to move by the consulate. And um, for some reason, we dis they decided to go to the Isle of Man. So we found passage, one of the last ships to leave the Hong Kong Harbor for, uh, in, this is 1951. If you remember, and now it comes to me that that was uh, uh, during the, the uh, Korean conflict. conflict. So um, I haven't researched that, but I'm sure that was the reason that uh, we had to leave. And uh, we ended up in uh, the Isle of Man, and um, my uh, my uncle uh, Herbie Herbert um, owned three properties. As the oldest male, and on the island, this British rule of the oldest male gets everything; everybody else gets nothing. So uh, he had three properties, and uh, he offered us uh, uh, to stay and Kendrakad. Uh, if I can pronounce that property. And uh, that's the name of the, 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 the house in Kirk Michael, uh, off of Orisdale Road in the Isle of Man. And um, we stayed there uh, almost three years. And then, <coughs> and then you, when you come to the United States, and did you go to high school here in the United States? Um, I, I did. I, uh, 
we got back in uh, 1954, in January of 54, and um, I was put back a grade. Uh, so I went to eighth grade at uh, Funston School in Chicago on Armitage Avenue. And uh, then I was in the Thule High School District. So my assigned high school was Thule, and I attended there four years. I, I graduated uh, in 1960. And uh, when did you enlist in the Army, or were you drafted? <clears throat> I was drafted. Um, if, if you remember back uh, in those times, the draft was uh, in place. And uh, so uh, initially, in 1963, uh, I was, uh, well, first of all, I, I had delayed the draft because I was attending school. I attended uh, a little known fact that Navy Pier was a University of Illinois two-year college. Mm -hmm. And it was my intention to uh, go to school, and I did. I registered uh, as a, uh, for aeronautical engineering. I always wanted to be an engineer, and I always wanted to fly. So that's what, what I intended to do. However, I took on more than I could chew. Uh, at that time, you could um, register for up to 20 semester hours for, I believe it was $135. So uh, I tackled the whole 20 hours and didn't make it. So um, uh, then I entered Wright Junior College to pick up uh, some courses that, uh, that Thule did not provide me. Okay, Lane Tech would have been a better pick, but for some reason that did not happen. So I had to deal with what I had. What was uh, your thought process when you uh, knew you were you had been drafted? What well, first of all, uh, I thought that I could get my education, you know, uh, uh, finished. Uh, and draft was on my mind. And um, but um, I went a couple of semesters to Wright Junior College, and then I didn't register for the fall semester in '63. So on Christmas Eve, I got a letter, and it did say greetings. And it uh, told me to report to the induction center. Uh, it's about th it was about three blocks from uh, Union Station. Uh, and uh, I reported there on uh, January the 10th. But prior to that, between Wright College and that point in time, I went to the Air Force because I wanted to fly. Your love of aeronautics. Right. And um, I took the uh, application for the Air Force to be a pilot. And I remember when I, uh, when I took it, it was a very lengthy examination. Turns out it was a psychological examination. I don't know if they, th they want you to be crazy to fly or if they want you to be sane. I right. never figured that out. But uh, I did take the examination. I passed, and they said, Okay, we'll, we'll take you. And I said, what is the term, the, uh, the requirement? Well, it's six years. I kind of thought at that time, oh, that's a lifetime, and declined. It, so it wasn't within weeks after that that I got my draft notice. And how old were you at this time? At that time, I was uh, 23. And so <clears throat> you're drafted, um, and uh, you're in the Army. Uh, where did you go to basic training at? I uh, I was uh, I spent the whole day at the the draft uh, induction center, and at the end of the day, uh, I don't know if you ever if you know this, but the center uh, was very it was on the second floor of this building, and they had like red, blue, and other colored lines, and they you got in and they tell you what line to get in, and you follow that line around the whole building. And then you go to the next color, and then the next color. At the end of that, if you had passed all the tests, you were uh, sworn in. And later on, I went to this building, because this building is now owned by Commonwealth Edison. And it's our data processing center. And I said to one of the, my friends, I said, you know what? I says, I can remember where I was sworn in. And I walked down the hall on the north side to the end, and I looked in this, it said meeting room, and I said, this is the room. I said, here's where I was standing. And in that corner was the flag and the captain 
that swore us in. I remember it exactly, you know, that room. So they, they marched us over to Union Station, and we got on a, a sleeper car train and went to Fort Knox that night. Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, overnight. Um, do you remember the captain that swore you in? I do not remember the captain. Um, so let's talk about basic training a little bit. You're away from home. Um, uh, you have to bond with new guys that you're going to have to work with. Mm -hmm. What's that experience like? It was a great experience uh, because, you know, having traveled, you know, uh, you know, around the world previous to this, uh, uh, I and my my mother was a uh, wonderful people person. She could talk to you and she could say, "Oh, you're from such and such a country." Uh, she kind of knew people, and I kind of liked people, and so got to meet peop people from all over the United States, and uh, it, it was great. I had a, a good friendship with an American Indian, and uh, and a fellow from uh, two fellows from California, and uh, another fellow, uh, John Nietzsche, from Chicago. So I, we had our own little group, small group that you know you could know. It's like like high school or college, right? initially, uh, with a lot more stress. Um, and speaking to that, to the stress, how tough was the training? The training was tough. I, I personally was in pretty good shape, uh, but there were some uh, inductees that were not, that were possibly, you know, uh, overweight or um, not good at, you know, uh, running long distances. and. It was it was hard for some people, and you know we tried to uh, stay together to help each other and to get through it. Uh, um, what do you think was tougher, the physical aspect or the mental aspect? Uh, I, th I think the uh, at that point I, th I I think the physical aspect. You know, it's uh, uh, you had to be in shape. Um, what was the chow like? Um, Did they feed you pretty good? Actually, actually, the chow was pretty good. I, I have to tell you, though, that uh, if you were a slow eater, and I was, uh, if you were one of the last ten people in the, at, the, at the table eating your chow, you got to wash the dishes. That's called KP, kitchen police. And so being a slow eater, I experienced many of those situations. But coming from a big family, you understand that sometimes you've got to take on some extra chores. Yes. So you leave Fort Knox. Where do you go uh, for your advanced training? Well, before uh, before I go to my advanced training, I went back to Chicago and I was uh, dating a girl named Sharon, and we decided to get married. Mm -hmm. And so um, well, I'm sorry I didn't bring that picture. I still have that on our dresser. Uh, so we uh, we got married, and I was in my greens, my dress greens, which I brought today to show you, and. Um, uh, so we were married on March the 30th, and then back I went to uh, uh, Fort Sill uh, in Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma, for uh, uh, artillery training. And uh, t let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, to the average person, artillery is you know you, you put the projectile in there and you pull the thing, but it's a lot more advanced than that, right? It is. It's a very um, synchronized ballet, if I can use the word. It's, uh, uh, you've got a three-man uh, 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 team, and um, uh, you've got a, a cannon cocker, you've got a, a loader, and then you've got the, uh, uh, you've got the, uh, uh, the, the powder. Uh, you've got a 105 millimeter howitzer has got um, seven bags of powder. So uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, lieutenant or the sergeant well, who's ever commanding uh, the gun will say uh, charge seven. Well, you don't have to do anything. Charge six, you pull off the last bag, you put the powder in, uh, a projector, the powder, and close the breech, and with your left hand, you pull the uh, lanyard, and away she goes. And uh, so you're constantly on the radio also, I would assume, with forward observers mm -hmm. who are uh, telling you where to shoot these mm -hmm. projectiles. Mm -hmm. and, and how often is that radio chatter? Uh, it's constant. 
Uh, it, but the three uh, cannoneers are not on the uh, radio. We have a, a, a radio uh, person uh, that is in contact with the forward observer, and uh, they'll give you a deflection and, uh, and uh, elevation, and you'll make those corrections on the gun and, uh, before you fire. And how many uh, uh, cannons are in a squad, a platoon, a battalion? How many are there? Yeah, there's uh, three in the battalion. And uh, uh, so uh, when we went to Vietnam, my unit was 105 millimeter howitzers. Then we had another unit uh, with one 55 millimeter. And then we had another one with uh, one 75 millimeter howitzer. So we had three sizes of guns. They were all towed, and they were the old style with the split fork. And <coughs> were you, I mean, that's a pretty big target, too. Did you ever think about that? Is it, you know, hey, this is a pretty big target. People know that our gun is right here. Yeah. Uh, we're trained, you know, to take orders, and we're given a, a, an azimuth and an elevation, and, a, and uh, you know, we're told to fire. So. Um, uh, that you, you kind of divorce yourself away from where that projectile is going and what it's hitting, especially you know in Vietnam. Um, in the time I served uh, in November of uh, '65, um, I really don't, I really can't tell you exactly where I was, but I do know that history tells me there was an Ia Drang uh, uh, conf there's a, a war a conflict going on at that time and we were supporting the 101st Airborne Division out of Da Nang so um, I can only assume that's what we did it you know I remember it was it was an all-night shoot you know maybe a thousand rounds or possibly more and I'm pretty sure it was more than one day my memory fails me on that part what's the uh, what's the uh, sound uh, any loss of hearing? Yes. Actually, I was at Heinz Hospital a week ago Thursday for a, a hearing test. I have uh, three frequency loss on the left ear, around 4,000, around 6,000, around 8,000 hertz. And, of course, we're talking at 4,160. Um, and you think this, obviously, uh, as we all get older, you know, we lose... But do you think that was uh, brought on by standing around these these huge guns? Oh yeah, no question. Because as the as the uh, uh, cannon as the cannon as the uh, lanyard puller, you know, I was right next, and I don't remember being issued any hearing protection. Uh, there probably was two reasons. It was probably because we had to hear the commands, and uh, uh, I don't know if 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 that's the reason or not, but. Uh, uh, yes, I, I definitely think that uh, that contributed to hearing loss. Now, you were in the Trang? Yes. What was uh, it like uh, the living? You were there for a year? No, I was there. Uh, I, was, I was there. The story, here's the story. When, I, uh, uh, when we got our orders in uh, July to, um, to uh, go to Vietnam, it was for the, 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 the whole group. So in Fort Lewis, it was 3,500 soldiers. So um, we were allowed to take a, uh, a leave to uh, bring our wives back to their hometown. I brought my wife back to Chicago and she stayed with her parents. And um, so then that was uh, in July. So then in August, uh, then we all as a group uh, went on a, a training maneuvers and we traveled uh, through Snoqualmie Pass to the uh, Yakima Reservation, and it's a huge federal reservation that I assume was formerly belonged to the Yakima Indians. And um, we trained uh, with our howitzers. Now, what we did was a very complicated uh, maneuver. It's called time on target. So the 105s had about a seven mile range, the 155s about a 12 mile range and then the 175 is about a 23 mile range. So we surrounded at different azimuths this central target and we all fired and at such a time so that the projectile would hit the target at one second, yeah. at one certain second. 
So we fired first, and the 10, the 155s fired second, and the, and the 175s fired, fired third. And so I did bring a picture uh, showing you the graduation. It was a big deal. And so here we are training for jungle duty uh, in the sands of the uh, state of Washington. Washington. Yes. Now, what was it like for some of your buddies uh, once you got over to Vietnam? Some, you, yourself, you mentioned you had traveled uh, and been overseas uh, as a child. Uh, some of these guys had never left their hometown. What That's that, right. What That's was right. that like? For well, them? for instance, uh, uh, one of my uh, good friends, uh, James Call, uh, he was from the hills of Kentucky, and uh, uh, he was definitely, you know, out of you know, out of his place, you know. Uh, never been, uh, you know, le had never had left uh, Kentucky. And now he's in the Army, you know, alongside me and, and you know, having to go, you know, to Vietnam. So it was, it was hard for those, for those guys, but, you know, we were, we were a team. You had to be a team. You had to trust your fellow soldier, and uh, we all got through it together. Um, how did, uh, while you were stationed over there, did you have uh, any interaction with the civilians in Vietnam? Oh, we did. I have a picture I brought to share. Um, uh, I believe it was um, New Year's Day. The um, captain uh, asked me if I wanted to, uh, you know, take a leave. You know, and I said, "Well, no, sir." I says, "I'm due to go back January the 10th," uh, because I, I I didn't mention that when we all went to Vietnam in August. Or I see August. Uh, August was training. Uh, September. It could have been like October 12th, if I, if I don't remember rightly. Uh, um, it was a 19-day trip on the USS Breckenridge to. Um, it was 17 days to uh, to Bangkok, and then we were allowed to go into town for a few hours uh, while the ship refueled, and then it was two more days to Cameron Bay. So it was a 19-day journey, and the cutoff for this trip for the GIs was 90 days. I had 91. So that was the good part of it. What's it like uh, being on a ship for 19 days with a whole bunch of guys? It was very hard. Um, we were stacked uh, in, in the hold. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a ship that was, uh, was uh, taken from uh, a cargo company in the Korean War. And I found this out at uh, Cantini one day going through the museum. And I was staring at, uh, you know, I was staring at a ship and uh, a picture of a ship. And a Korean War veteran came up to me and he said, uh, Will you, did, did you go to Vietnam? I said, yeah. I says, on the USS Breckenridge. He says, well, I went to Korea on the USS Breckenridge. Now, what are the chances of that? Yeah. So it was a ship that they take from the cargo company for military use, give it back, and then take it again. So, um, uh, so I was uh, 19 days on the Breckenridge. So that the Breckenridge was essentially an indentured service. Uh, it was. Yeah. And they stacked us uh, 3,500 soldiers, six deep in the cargo hold. I was about in the middle. You had about six on hammocks, so you were had about maybe three to six inches between my nose and the one That'll above me. Test your patience. Yes, it? yes. So you get to Vietnam and uh, you deploy your weapons. <clears throat> no, we got to Vietnam in a, a passenger ship. Uh, our weapons came on cargo ships. Okay. And they arrived, uh, I'm gonna guess now, it's just a guess, my memory is uh, uh, maybe a week later. And so um, uh, getting back, you mentioned the train. Yes, when we, got there uh, in, uh, uh, in October, um, all we had was our backpacks and our weapons. Our, we had M14s. And um, we went to Natrang. Natrang is a, a hill, uh, a rubber plantation. I'm not sure if it's, I don't want to mention any brand names, but it's some rubber company, an American rubber company that rented the land. I, I assume they rented it, at least it. And uh, so we stayed on a rubber plantation. Well, uh, if you know your geography, uh, November is the start of the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were staying there waiting a week or two, you know, parked on the, the side of the hill 
at night, you know, with the sleeping on ma air mattresses, with our two-man tent. A two-man tent is, I own one half and you own one half. Right. I button them together and we sleep under it together. So, um, and all of a sudden, uh, thunder and lightning and rain, uh, I don't know, about four inches of rain come down the hill. I got up uh, out of my, uh, uh, out of my uh, mattress and put my feet down and looked and there was four inches of water running down the side and my mattress was running down the side of the hill after I got off of it. So that's, that was my first experience with a monsoon. Uh, it, it, nice way to welcome you to yes. in country. Huh? Welcome to country. Um, what about uh, the first time that things got a little tough when there was uh, actual shots fired? What was your reaction to that? Yeah, well, well that, that didn't uh, come yet. Uh, after uh, the train, uh, we had to wait for our, uh, car, our howitzers and our deuce and a halfs and all of our M151 Jeeps and our three-quarter ton uh, carriers, uh, personnel. Uh, so those came in and uh, I was in the motor pool. I had a dual MOS. I was uh, 63, uh, 810, I believe it was, uh, as a motor pool, but I was also a cannoneer. So uh, we all uh, manned the guns when it was possible. MOS being military occupation special. Correct, correct, correct. Um, what was, uh, again, when you had, saw your first action, or when uh, the whole team was there and, and the boss said, hey, we're getting in the game? Yeah. Well, uh, we, we picked up our, our, our trucks and uh, we uh, were assigned to the um, uh, uh, a secure camp, uh, 101st Airborne Division had their camp there um, in uh, Da Nang. So uh, it was like uh, about the size of, I'd say midway, about a mile square, you know, fenced and um, barbed wire. Uh, we had, uh, we pulled guard duty, we had uh, bunkers. We were required to take, uh, you know, two hours of uh, all night watches. And uh, so that part was, was good. We had, uh, by now we had our trucks. We had a PX, it was a tent, but we had a place to shop. And yeah, uh, you had a secure location. Secure location. And if you went off the base, again, to go back to the civilian, you, you uh, interacted with the civilians in the? Yes, uh, well, uh, being in the motor pool, uh, uh, I had responsibility for the, uh, uh, for, for, for the motor vehicles. And uh, uh, one particular uh, 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 thing that I had to do was uh, the lieutenants uh, had their own Jeeps. And so um, the Ford M151 uh, had a very bad uh, part of it. If you took a 90 degree turn at 29 miles an hour, it flipped over on its, on its back, on its, you know, flipped over, you know, 180 degrees. So uh, this broke the windshield. So I had uh, uh, the, uh, a chance to take it into Saigon to get a new uh, windshield. So I brought a guard with me, a, a you know, person, uh, an armed guard, and you know, drove a Highway 1 back down to Saigon. Uh, but the rules were you weren't supposed to uh, drive at night because at night uh, you could have some um, Vietnamese uh, laborers working on the post and they, those same laborers could go back to their cabin and pick up you know, uh, you know, dig up the, their AK-47s and put on their black pajamas and, and uh, you know, go out on their own missions. So w was there a lot of that? Was there a lot of uh, um, civilians who might uh, be your friend during the daytime and at night? It's a whole different story. Well, that was un undetermined because, uh, you know, uh, uh, the chances are good that, that you, you, you know, your particular people uh, would go somewhere and you know, the 101st would, if anybody would track them down, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I remember an occasion coming back from Saigon that it got dark on Highway 1 and uh, we, we passed by, we, we had, <laughs> it was just two of us and there was a patrol at night and uh, they had their AK-47s and, and I, I just, I looked at them, we were driving along 30 miles an hour and, uh, and my sergeant says, you know, what do we do? And I says, keep driving. Keep driving. And we just passed by each other. <laughs> so that was a, a very good thing. Um, 
what uh, what was it like um, being over there adjusting like you were talking about the monsoons I mean it's a whole different climate and uh, for instance uh, I hear stories about uh, the different uh, uh, snakes and spiders and mm -hmm. and different things that that guys saw over there. Yeah, I got another little story I, I did have to go on. Back then, uh, General Westmoreland instituted what they called a search and destroy. And uh, 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 what, what that was is that um, uh, they would get together a small patrol, maybe around six to 10, you know, uh, uh, GIs, and then we would uh, go down out into the jungle, leave the base camp and go out and uh, search for enemy activity. Uh, you know, these uh, North Vietnamese or Viet Cong that mm -hmm. were doing their own patrols. Uh, we, I went on one of them and uh, fortunately didn't find any enemy, but um, uh, one of the, the lead, uh, the point man, uh, brushed up against a, uh, a bush and he, get, he got bit by a two-stepper. Uh, a two-stepper is a small, very poisonous snake. I don't know the real name of it, it's called a two-stepper because nine times out of ten, uh, ninety percent of the time, you'll take two steps and die. Uh, but this particular time, the sergeant was very fast in uh, uh, let, um, uh, forcing the uh, the private to lay down, relax, you know, so his heart is not racing, uh, make an, uh, an ex incision, and then suck out the uh, poison, and uh, saved his life. That's outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, first of all, let me ask you, what did the men think of General Westmoreland? There was no front, like in World War II. You had, you had a front. You had, to go, you had to go to Omaha Beach, you had to push the Germans back, and you liberated you know, the, the people, and they loved you. Okay? Here, we did not have that. We had a hill. Conquered, back, give it back to the enemy. Uh, uh, I went uh, to uh, basic training at Fort Knox with an M1. I went to uh, Fort uh, Sill and Fort Lewis with an M14. And on um, Christmas Eve of uh, 1965, I was issued an AR-15. Um, now, that weapon was uh, not a good, not a good weapon. It was a bad design. It had a bad firing pin, and it jammed. You know, the little bit of sand. I understand now. Uh, I was at the Union League Club last night, and uh, there was a lieutenant colonel there that was uh, in charge of the um, ROTC at University of Illinois, and uh, he stated that uh, this. Um, the uh, M16, which is you know the later version of the AR15, uh, has been repaired. It's still not the best. Uh, in my personal opinion, uh, you know the AK47 is probably a better weapon. Uh, but now they have a, an, a, what they call an M4. Correct. That, that, that's that's a, a, a pretty good uh, pretty good weapon. But the uh, uh, the same gentleman said that the 105s are still around. Uh, they still uh, do a very good job. And uh, uh, how long does it take to deploy one of those? If, if if the bosses say, "Hey, you have to be in this spot, and you have to take your 105 howitzer," how long does it take to get it there and and get it set up? Not long. Uh, we can do it in minutes. You know, we uh, we'll get to a spot, and uh, you know the. Uh, the, the platoon leaders will set up here. We'll set up. We'll spread the uh, the, the, the legs, and then you know uh, we'll get an approximate azimuth, and then he'll bark off you know some directions, uh, 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 some coordinates, and uh, I'd say we could be loading that breach within three minutes. And let me ask you one uh, other question: You uh, were set up in support of the 101st Airborne. Let me ask you something, and, and does it get a little, uh, you know, little team thing going? Who's supporting who? Is the artillery supporting the uh, the 101st Airborne, or is the 101st Airborne supporting the artillery? That's a good question. Both. Uh, we're there to support them, 
and they they're there to protect us to protect you yes Correct. and uh, it's uh, uh, they're a great bunch of guys I've got a picture of uh, of uh, me in uh, Saigon and you'll see a lot of kids uh, in front of me and behind me you'll see uh, a 101st Airborne patch so they were they were right there with us and they're very good friends good we're over there for, for, on your downtime when you weren't if you had a day off or a couple mm -hmm. hours off mm -hmm. well I, I did bring a picture of, uh, of, uh, of me going into uh, Saigon I'll show it to you later um, and um, the, the kids actually uh, loved you you know uh, most of them but uh, I was warned when I was given that one day leave on New Year's Day uh, to be careful of, uh, of, uh, of personnel with bombs they would you know they would hide them under their clothes and uh, they would detonate the bombs and uh, you know kill themselves and take as many GIs you know so that you know at that time this is early on in the conflict so it, it happened uh, and and we were warned um, what was it uh, did you were you counting the days at some point where hey I'm gonna go back to the United States oh absolutely I and mean you're talking uh, you know 91 days so from the first day that I got on you know the ship which is 91 days from January the 9th 1966 because I was drafted on the 10th so if you count back the calendar you can see how many days you know when I left you know it was 91 days the ship departed in San Francisco um, so to, yes speak to that a little bit about coming home what was your thought process there well coming home uh, was, uh, was early uh, I was scheduled to leave Vietnam on January the 9th but uh, approximately on January the 3rd I was told to go report to the re recruiting so I walked into this recruiting uh, I don't know if it could have been a lieutenant and uh, asked me uh, if I wanted to re-up and offer me a $10,000 re-sign bonus. And That's a I, lot of money back then. In 66. That's a lot of money right now. In January 66, I probably could have bought a $5,500 66 Corvette, <laughs> uh, but I declined. And um, he wrote it down on my record, you know, declined re-enlistment. And um, the next morning, the 4th of January, uh, early in the morning, uh, there was a Huey a UH-1 helicopter waiting for me and uh, myself and I think about four other gentlemen four other guys from my unit I actually three from my unit and one from another unit uh, got on this Huey and actually that was the scariest part of my whole trip flying from Da Nang to Saigon Tansonut 50 feet above the ground with two machine gunners on either side at 50 feet elevation what was it like when you got back here? What were the uh, civilians like uh, when they saw you in your greens? Um, a lot of name calling. Uh, so uh, personally, on, on the airplane, uh, you had you had to take that, you know, because uh, we weren't welcome home um, because of the uh, during that time. Even that early on, if you look in your history book, you see that. While I was in Vietnam, there was already demonstrations going on. And uh, so uh, the American public did not like uh, the war in Vietnam. It was not a war, it was a police action. It wasn't declared a war by Congress. So basically we were you know, day to day at the whim of the, the president. Um, how did, uh, did all of your buddies did they did they have political views uh, at, or did they just you know hey we're in the army and we're just working yes uh, I don't remember you know discussing except what I mentioned earlier I don't uh, remember that uh, they had their their own you know polit political uh, views uh, we uh, we had a president and he's the commander-in-chief uh, we obeyed his orders and we had General Westmoreland and we did what they told us to do. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about, again about your buddies. I know you're uh, very involved in veterans associations. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked you before we came on, are you familiar with Tammy Duckworth? 
I am. She's the uh, Illinois. Uh, uh, She's Veterans Affairs off, uh, Officer uh, yeah. for the uh, uh, United States of America. Yes, I am uh, familiar with her. Uh, I personally got involved with the American Legion in about 1994. I originally joined Marn Post 13 here in Plainfield. And in uh, 1991, I was working, I'm a microwave engineer. Uh, which, by the way, I, I did mention I uh, thank you to the, uh, to the uh, GI Bill. I was able to finish my education at night and I uh, got my electrical engineering degree in power. Uh, but when I got my degree and went to work uh, in 1988, uh, they wanted me to be a telecommunications engineer, microwave, and uh, PBXs. So uh, uh, that's what I did. And I was up, up on the, uh, the roof of the Edison building, 72 West Adams. I was coming down the 20th floor and the Commonwealth Edison Post 118 office is on the 20th floor. I was walking by and I saw the logo and I said, oh, excuse me, I said, you have your own uh, legion. And uh, a fellow by the name of Joe Sikorsky said, yeah, come in, come in. Uh, you work for ComEd? I says, yeah, I says, I'm an engineer. And he says, are you a veteran? I says, yeah. Do you belong to the legion? I says, yeah, I says, I belong to Plainfield Post 13. He says, no, you've got to join our, our post. I goes, why? He says, well, we're a close post. If you're, an, if you're an employee of Commonwealth Edison, you've got to belong to our post. So he got me transferred into uh, Commonwealth Edison, and I've been involved with them. I was commander in uh, 2002 of the Legion Post. And in 2005, I was, uh, I was made commander of uh, the second district. The second district is comprised of uh, 13 uh, legion posts, and they include uh, uh, some very renowned, uh, very great posts like the Union League Club of Chicago, Union League, formed in the Civil War, uh, Cantini, Chicago Tribune, uh, post 758, and uh, so there we have a lot of, you know, and banking. Back in the 1960s, there was about Know, 58 posts in my district and each building in downtown State Street and Michigan Avenue you know had their own posts you know Continental Bank um, uh, Montgomery Wards Commonwealth Edison uh, Chicago Tribune and uh, I, I still have a World War II veteran by the name of John Geiger uh, who ultimately became national commander in my uh, district and he's a great supporter of, of um, of me and my duties. How much responsibility is that to be a commander of a, of a post? It's a big responsibility uh, because uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, the American Legion was founded um, after uh, uh, World War I. Uh, well, the Legion was, f was formed after World War I uh, and uh, it was meant to serve uh, uh, veterans uh, returning from the war and their families and their children. And so we have a lot, a big responsibility, and we have many, many, I have many commissions and committees uh, that, that, that I appoint uh, to, to head up, and uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's great, you know, to help uh, returning veterans and their families. What do you think <coughs> from even before you entered the service up until now, and while you were in the service, what do you think the biggest challenges are for veterans when they return home? Well, that, that's, that's a really tough question, and uh, I will have to say that today, the veterans returning home is a lot different than Vietnam, but also a lot the same. Let me explain. You know, back in World War I, World War II, you had uh, stress from, from, from the war. Uh, there was killing going on, there was, uh, there was a lot of things going on that uh, was very stressful. And um, I think back in World War II, they called it shell shock. Uh, in Vietnam, they didn't call it anything. anything. 
Uh, and uh, now they call it post-traumatic stress. And so right now, I would answer your question by saying the biggest challenge for those returning now would be to recover from post-traumatic stress. And I differ from the government. They say, you know, 20% suffer. I say 100% suffer, you know, but there's three, I studied this, there's three different levels of post-traumatic. Personally, you know, all I had to deal with was, you know, the, the, the sound of the howitzers. And I dealt with that for 10 years. And I, I couldn't sleep for 10 years. So, and that was mild, uh, uh, what's called now mild PTSD. But what I mean uh, about today is uh, you've got these great medical officers and you've, you, you know, we've, they're facing tremendous, tremendous uh, problems with IEDs. And, um, you know, these, they, you know, they'll be on patrol. They'll, they're not facing an enemy. They'll hit an IED and they'll get blown up. And, and uh, uh, I've been to some of the, uh, the meetings of Union League and Cantini Post uh, uh, has speakers. And this is one of the privileges I have as commander to attend these and to listen to these uh, speeches and, and appeals to uh, the American Legion and the VFW population, you know, for support. And um, uh, right now, I just, like yesterday, heard about this uh, outfit in, I believe it's California, where uh, they have these um, uh, advanced prosthetics. And, uh, and believe it or not, and this is a shame, it's not financed by the government as volunteer dollars like American Legion. So we collect from soldiers, former soldiers, as in the American Legion and the VFW, uh, which I'm a member of both, uh, and, and we, we support these groups uh, that are helping um, uh, those that are, have lost limbs. And uh, there's been a high percentage coming back in this conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, recovered, okay? Back in Vietnam, if you stepped on a, a, an IED or something, uh, the chances are pretty good you would not survive. But, because uh, you had to get the helicopter in there and that came under fire. Uh, but now, um, uh, somehow, they managed to get these uh, soldiers that are injured, uh, 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 evacuated into Germany and to these wonderful military doctors who have volunteered their time to serve. There are doctors that have their, their, their surgeons that have said, okay, I'm gonna do my part. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier about uh, you couldn't sleep for 10 years because of the, <clears throat> you were still, <clears throat> did, did you specifically, and also some of your buddies, when you came home, did, did, there, did your family or did their family say, you're different, you've changed, you're, um, no, my, my family, uh, you know, I think I had brought that picture I can share with you. Uh, my family welcomed me home, and uh, especially my wife and my young daughter <clears throat> were very glad to see me. But the, the public um, really didn't welcome you home. <clears throat> I'll tell you one story that uh, the first time I was welcomed home, uh, it was 1988 and I had uh, got my uh, degree. I was working as a telecommunication engineer for ComEd, and I was installing a new telephone switch, a PBX, at Libertyville, a brand new headquarters in Libertyville. And my technician was Lonnie Stojan, he, and he was the uh, commander of the uh, POW MIA. And um, he was wearing his Vietnam cap, and so I went into the office that morning and I was wearing a suit and uh, I said, good morning, Lonnie. And uh, I said, good morning, Sam. And I uh, says, uh, Lonnie, I said, you got a Vietnam cap on. I says, uh, did you serve in that? He says, yeah. He says, I did. I said, oh. He says, did you? And I says, yes, I did. Uh, he says, well, where'd you serve? I says, uh, Vietnam, and yeah, end of 65, early 66. He stood up, stuck out his hand, shook my hand and said, welcome home. So 88, that was my first welcome home. Have you uh, kept in touch with uh, any of the guys that, uh, that you were overseas with? 
I have not. I, uh, I brought my uh, orders that, uh, that have the names of John Nitschke and uh, a few others um, that left with me, you know, uh, from Tanzania on that day. Um, and I've been tempted, actually this morning I was at the library, tempted to do a research on John Nitschke, but, uh, uh, but I didn't have time. But I'm tempted, but no, I have not talked to any of them. Well, the important thing is that you're helping out other veterans. Um, what, uh, what lessons do you think uh, Vietnam taught you uh, for later in life? Well, I, I have to say that even though I only had a 91-day commitment, uh, the fact that I served in Vietnam uh, benefited uh, you know, uh, me by being able to at this point, uh, help veterans. I don't think I would be doing what I do now if I had, you know, dodged the draft like you know, some, some people did back then. You know. And how how did that affect the morale uh, with the guys that you did serve with, knowing that uh, uh, certain people found a way out? Mm -hmm. Not good. Uh, um, I, I think that everybody I served with. They, uh, they were commanded to report, and they reported, and they, when they were told to, to go, they went. And uh, so anybody that didn't do that was not thought of uh, very highly. Well, <coughs> Sam, we thank, all of us thank you so very much for your uh, service to your country. You're um, let's get a look at some of this uh, memorabilia here. Okay, Jay, this is... Uh, Special order number four, uh, dated 4 January 66. And this is the order I mentioned in the interview that uh, ordered me to leave Vietnam and return to the United States of America. Probably the happiest day of, of your life, huh? That's, uh, that's exactly right. And here I am on the bottom. Uh, U.S. 55779877. Uh, back then, we didn't use Social Security numbers. It's pre-Social Security. And um, it's, it's telling me to, uh, assigning me to the United States Army Reserve, uh, um, U.S. Army Administration Center, St. Louis, Missouri, and directed me to go to Oakland, California. Okay. Jay, this is the uh, uniform that I mentioned that I came back the very uniform I came back on the airplane on that 707 from Oakland to Chicago and uh, I received one medal and it's the uh, Vietnam Service Medal and uh, here is the uh, 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 sharpshooter for a rifle uh, what's missing here is uh, is my uh, uh, expert for uh, the machine gun the M60 machine gun which is uh, which is in my record and this is your battalion patch here? Uh, yes, this is the, uh, um, this is the uh, flaming sword, we call it, uh, because it's a sword in a red background and uh, with the uh, building in the background. Um, uh, you know, that, that symbol, the building symbol, reminds me of the Army Corps of Engineers. And one thing I neglected to tell you was that uh, when I arrived in Vietnam uh, in 65, the Army Corps of Engineers had built a city in Cameron Bay with an 8,000-foot runway, which was amazing. I, I neglected that. That's a, that was very impressive. Even today, I would like to talk to somebody from the Army Corps of Engineers that uh, was there, that how, built that city. How did you do that? It was great. Yeah. I mean, you had uh, sidewalks, wood sidewalks, and streets. You had a movie theater, a PX. You had an 8,000 foot runway. It was just amazing what they did in like in a year. But uh, that's the uniform and there's the artillery uh, symbol right there. Outstanding, thank you, Sam. All right, Jay, this is a, a picture of uh, me in uh, basic training at Fort Knox. So this is uh, between January and March of 1964. And you can see I'm wearing a, 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 an armband with corporal stripes. Well, the story is, is that at this time I was 23, so I was an old guy. You were pops. I was pops, 
And so they immediately put me in charge. So here I am, acting corporal in basic training. <clears throat> okay, this is, uh, I've, got a, I've got my stripe, so this will be uh, Fort Lewis. Uh, or this in, is a, in Washington. In Washington, you can see the, the flag, similar to my, uh, my brass. That was our, uh, our, um, our, our emblem for uh, the 27th Artillery. Okay, now this one is myself with the M60. Viet with the M60, so um, this will uh, have to be. It'll either be my training in August uh, of uh, of '65 for the M60, which I qualified as um, expert, and so that I was issued the M60, which I was very happy. It's a lot better weapon than the AR-15, so that would. This is probably. Training and Yakima. It, it, it could be in Vietnam too. I'm uh, not sure. How much uh, does that weapon weigh? Oh, I'd say I guess around 40 pounds. And uh, with with the weapon, I had uh, uh, two reels of uh, 500, uh, two cans of ammo. So I had an ammo carrier. I actually had an ammo carrier. That um, this is a, a little blurry, but this is. Uh, one of the Ford M151 Jeeps I told you about. Mm -hmm. Told you that story about the, the Jeep. And um, this this is us uh, in August uh, 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 packing up at Fort Knox to go to Yakima uh, Reservation uh, firing range. And uh, you can see uh, we camouflaged uh, the headlights. Uh, we put uh, 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 mud on our numbers and our letters, on, uh, so everything was uh, secret. And this is myself, uh, one of my friends took this of me. Uh, this is in July of, uh, of uh, 1965, and I'm in full uh, combat uniform, and you're wondering, what's all that snow? Well, in order to get to the re uh, reservation, we had to go through Snoqualmie Pass, and there was a lot of snow through the pass. You go there today in the summer, and you can ex experience it. I'd say you should do that. This is the day that uh, uh, you d you'll have to uh, uh, trace back from um, uh, from the dates I gave you. This this is the very day. There's James Call, very good friend of mine, an excellent mechanic, and uh, he's the, uh, the gentleman from Kentucky. And uh, you can see us, uh, the rest of the uh, soldiers, just waiting there. We are now. All we have is a, a, a duffel bag, and we're waiting for the bus, the coach, to take us to San Fran. Uh, I mentioned that I traveled on the USS Breckenridge. This is the Breckenridge, and you can see I'm holding a book. Well, um, 19 days is a long time. I had no duties, you know. So what did I do? Well, I wanted to be a pilot, and since I, the Air Force didn't work out, I'm taking my ground course for uh, aviation. So I took it by correspondence, and I did the, uh, each study, and I mailed it in from the uh, Breckenridge uh, when uh, the mail had to go through. Did you ever subsequently get your pilot's license? Yes, I did. And uh, in 19, uh, by 1973, I was able to start my uh, private uh, license. I had passed the uh, ground school um, back in, uh, in, in uh, Vietnam, and um, I got my license on January the 20th, 1966. I've been flying ever since. Here's our uh, our ship coming in to Okinawa. This is the tug that pushed us into the port to refuel. This is the Army LT-535. This is our v first view of uh, Cameron Bay when we're coming into the bay. Uh, two days later, we're coming into the bay in uh, Vietnam to get ready to uh, disembark. This is a view of uh, me and our, uh, I mentioned our two-man tent. There it is, and we are here, unbeknownst to us, waiting for a monsoon. And 
this picture here is me uh, uh, beside our tent. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, there is a, a rifle, and don't say gun. There's a rifle uh, sitting there, and that's an M14. So this would be prior to Christmas Day, uh, 1965, because uh, we did not have our AR-15s yet. This is a good view of the air mattresses. This could have been taken the day before the monsoon because the mattresses are it's safely there. under the tent, not floating down the side of the rubber plantation. This is a view of the, um, of the trucks. You can see a deuce and a half there. Mm -hmm. So you know that this is a couple of weeks after we got there and we have gone to Cameron Bay, picked up our trucks, and we are back at our camp. This is a view a couple of days later. They have set up the mess tent. And you have to remember that those two weeks we waited, we ate nothing but sea rations. Uh, why do they call them sea rations? I don't know. Um, they're called, uh, today they're called uh, MRE, Eve. meals ready to Eve. eat. Uh, but uh, in Korea, they call them K rations. Um, I don't know. You'll have to. But there we are, and a great day because our first hot meal. Here I am at a bunker uh, that uh, that we had duties to man every uh, uh, every night, and uh, and uh, I, just a, a shot of me get, uh, in Vietnam. This is our our bunker. These are sandbags. And here's a shot of me, and I guess it wasn't that bad. I am smiling. <laughs> Looked like a pretty stout lad. Yes, uh, if you'll notice in the picture, uh, there's an Aussie hat. Uh, the Australians were there mm -hmm. supporting us, and I, I got that as a gift from an Aussie soldier, and very, very, very great guys. Very, very nice, very nice uh, soldiers. Um, this probably should have been uh, behind that other picture because now we are actually enjoying that first hot meal. Here's our mess tent. Do you recall what that uh, first hot meal was? I do not. So this is the day we received our, um, our M16 or AR-15. So it's a picture of me in front of our bunker with the, our new gift, which we would find out later. We would have loved to keep the M14s. And here's that view of uh, the town and uh, probably in the train. Uh, you can see the barbed wire, but we're on the other side of the barbed wire and there's uh, uh, that's the downtown uh, shopping center. So you can go in there and get anything you want, including uh, Fruit of the Loom t-shirts and underwear. <laughs> uh, and here's that picture I mentioned earlier about uh, you know, being in Saigon. You can see the, uh, uh, the young uh, people, the young citizens of, it, of the town uh, gathered around me, and you're saying to me, well, why is it in color? Well, one of these young people had a color Polaroid camera, and he came up to me and he said, GI, GI, take your picture, one dollar. And I said, I'll do that, and this is it. <laughs> this is the only color picture I have, uh, except for the few coming up here next, but uh, uh, my personal camera was, uh, uh, in this case here, was a black and white, an old 35 millimeter. And here's that uh, 101st Airborne guy I mentioned uh, right there, uh, uh, Staff Sergeant. And here I am in my overseas cap and my, uh, now this is uh, January 65. Uh, but you got to remember that it was summertime in Vietnam, so I'm wearing my summer uh, uniform, and uh, 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 I'm in front of, uh, of a Tan Sanut Airport, and I am getting ready to um, uh, waiting for the 707, and with this great bunch of guys, here's all, all of my guys from my unit and other units assembling. Uh, on the steps of Tansonut, just waiting one last time.
And this this shot, I hope no uh, army generals uh, uh, see this because I don't think photography was allowed. But uh, this is uh, what was behind. Uh, uh, th th those are the jets and the probably the uh, uh, 101s and the F4s that were uh, that were uh, uh, did all the uh, fli flights. Uh, uh, a lot of missions they did was um, uh, fast uh, forward of F F O, and a fast uh, uh, F O is a jet a one o uh, one o one jet that would travel at about 450 miles an hour instead of your uh, L nineteen which traveled at uh, uh, 80 mile 80 uh, knots, and they would um, spot the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the cargo coming down Highway 1 and destroy the uh, enemy targets. And finally, uh, I mentioned that uh, the family was very happy to receive me. This is my family. There's Sharon, and there's my uh, sister's daughter, uh, Wendy, and uh, there's my daughter, uh, Donna, uh, who had uh, was just uh, brand new when, when I left. And uh, there's me and my dad and my oldest brother and uh, my brother's uh, son and my sister's uh, son. And there's my mom behind uh, Timothy. So that's the family. And that uh, ends the pictures. After your service in Vietnam and uh, the sacrifice you made for this country, was it worth it? I would say yes. You know, I, I would say that uh, at the time, um, well, first of all, we were doing a job we were told to do. Uh, but politically, um, the thought was that the South Vietnamese were being persecuted by uh, the communist regime, okay? The, uh, um, the Army of North Vietnam, uh, that was the official Chinese-supported, Russian-supported, you know, big dollars behind them, you know. Uh, and the, um, uh, the communist uh, uh, North uh, uh, Vietnam. Um, they were kind of, you know, from villages and stuff like that. And they, we th you know, the, the thought was that they were being, that they were persecuting the South. And that we were there to um, free them from persecution. So um, it, it probably, it, it's an open question as to whether that's, the right story, but that was the belief. What uh, What are your thoughts on uh, on current events now in terms of the military? Well, I talked about that last night to uh, a major general uh, and uh, retired, and um, he said that, um, and I agree that it's a really tough situation. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the Army uh, uh, the veterans that serve over there uh, have got to serve two, three, four tours, okay? This is a major problem because um, after one tour, say your first stage, PTSD, after the second tour, you're the second stage. After the third tour, you're the third stage, and it's the worst stage. What we're seeing today is those that are suffering from major post-traumatic is a high incident of suicide. And this is a very, very bad thing, very sad. And uh, it was just in the news uh, of, uh, of a young, uh, right in the, in the in newspaper, local paper, recently this week, of this uh, uh, young woman, uh, this young mother, that her her husband took took it. Uh, it's, it's it's such as so that's that's the thing that I think needs to be addressed. The two major things is the post traumatic getting help to everyone that comes back right away, not waiting, you know. And this is and the second thing is is the uh, the loss of limbs for those that have you know encountered IEDs. Let, let me ask you in the future, do you see any significant change in uh, first off military deployment and secondly the use of the military? 
Well, that's another good question. I, I, I personally, even though I have you know three, you know, grand, uh, five grandchildren, uh, three boys and two girls, uh, I think the problem. Why is everybody going back and back and back? Because they don't have the personnel. You know, back in Vietnam, at least we had the draft. And you don't even want to say that today because the public is very much against the draft. But right now, it's an all-volunteer army and National Guard. Now, these young men and women, and I say women because they were not fighting beside us in Vietnam. They're fighting now. Uh, As Tammy Duckworth so right. valiantly did. Right. Uh, she was uh, uh, a co-pilot in a, in a uh, Chinook helicopter, and they got blown off. And I, 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 I don't want to go into her story, but her story is, is very, very gripping. Uh, but right now, um, we've got to uh, find the, the people you know, to staff the Army so that you know, these, these uh, veterans aren't going back again and again and again. Do you think that the draft is a viable option? I, you know, I think I, right now it's not even being discussed. You know, it may be mentioned, you know, by us, but, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, the American Legion, uh, what we do is we draft resolutions. And these resolutions go up from the post level to the department level, which is state of Illinois in Bloomington, to the national level, uh, which is in Indianapolis, the headquarters. And these are taken by the national commander to Washington, D.C. Now, last year, we had a uh, national commander from Illinois, and uh, Martin Conester. And he's a great, great commander. And uh, he uh, personally saw through this most recent veterans benefit um, it doesn't match the GI Bill like I went on. Now I was getting these monthly checks and I only had two years of service. Now it's got something to do with uh, your contribution and your length of service. So it's much, it's not as, not as good, but it's something for, the, for college education. Let me ask you something. The, uh, <coughs> the local post commanders or the state post commanders, when they go to Washington with something on their mind, uh, how are they received by the uh, bureaucracy? Uh, they're, they're received uh, very well. Uh, Marty, uh, Commander Canester, uh, he, he's now uh, past commander, he was received very well. He met, I believe he said, personally told me three times with President Bush. And one, one time when he mentioned uh, the GI Bill, um, he said, well, I'll get to it. And Marty said, uh, Mr. President, uh, you know, we need to get to it now. And he said, uh, well, come back in an hour. And an hour later, he had his staff. Because the president, you know, he's got his experts. You know, let's face it, you know, we're going to have a new president fairly soon, and uh, he's not going to be an expert on anything. He's going to have his experts. So President Bush called in his experts, and and everybody, and they looked at it, and they said, well, we think we can do this, we can do this, and he, he pushed it through. So that's, that's, that's a great accomplishment of the American Legion. So you, the American Legion basically feels like Washington, D.C. Is, is doing the best they can to, to help the local posts? And no. No. No, no uh, and that's, that's a struggle. I mean, we're always uh, coming up you know, uh, for instance, um, uh, I, I think it was earlier this year or last year, they uh, changed the uh, length of the assignment in Iraq and Afghanistan from 12 to 15 months, and possibly there was an 18 month. Well, uh, American Legion was against this because of the reasons I stated earlier and uh, fought to have that reduced back to 12 months, and they were successful. Talk about some of the other uh, things the American Legion does aside from helping veterans. You have a lot of other charitable uh, uh, things that you work on. Yes, I do. We have many things. Uh, Americanism uh, Commission is big in helping uh, uh, kids. We have, uh, we have a, um, uh, scholarship awards 
for, for, for high school graduates to go to college. Uh, the Union League Club uh, mentioned that they have uh, five $5,000 uh, scholarship awards. That's uh, 25000 that has been donated uh, by civilians, by ex, you know, uh, 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 veterans. And, um, uh, and we have a, a eighth grade Americanism Award for those uh, eighth grade students that the school, the principal or the teacher decide uh, and I, I uh, the commanders present them. Uh, I presented one to uh, uh, Armor School in Chicago at 33rd and, uh, and State. And um, so uh, that, that award is, is to get uh, your eighth graders into a pa patriotism, you know, and uh, uh, th th there's th th they're issued a certificate and a medal and uh, with the five, you know, courage and honor and integrity and all, all of those uh, things that uh, we would like our, uh, because these are our, our future, uh, uh, for, you know, for America. We have to, you know, teach them these principles. Do you monitor here locally which schools are, uh, uh, have ROTC programs perhaps? or you know, anything that would steer a student towards the military? Um, what we do is uh, we, 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 we can go to the grade schools and, uh, and send them a letter and uh, get them, try to get them involved. Uh, for Plainfield, it's uh, Marn Post, and they do their, their share of uh, these awards and the scholarships. Uh, for, uh, for me in Cook County, uh, we, uh, most of our schools are in the uh, Chicago and metropolitan area. But yes, I do monitor and uh, always uh, ask for uh, more input from the schools. Sam, uh, so having served in the military, and again, uh, your country thanks you, um, what would be, uh, what would you tell a young person what the advantages would be to enlist in any branch of the service? Well, there's the advantages are, are great. Uh, first of all, uh, it'll teach uh, the young person um, uh, responsibility, uh, teach them to obey their obey orders, and you know obey their parents, <clears throat> and um, give them a sense of of uh, of doing something, you know, for the good of their country, because. We're, we all live here in the United States of America, and uh, we, we have to support our country and our president. So that, I would say to all of the young people that are watching this now in the village of Plainfield is please consider um, joining the military. Think about doing something for your country, uh, either uh, joining the military to help, uh, you know, uh, help fight this war, to end this war, Know, because, yes, we we don't like war. You know, we're, we're veterans, but we don't like war. We're we're here to um, uh, protect the country and keep it safe. Uh, but if you don't like going to war, you could uh, go volunteer in a foreign land or something like that. Or, or we have uh, Sons of the American Legion. We have Women's Auxiliary. There's uh, I talked to a young uh, to a, a woman last night that volunteers at Heinz Hospital one day a week. You can do that. Uh, so there's something you can do for your country. Please do it. Thank you, Sam. My name is Jay Vermetti, and for the Plainfield Television Group, and also on behalf of the Plainfield Public Library, this has been an interview for the Veterans History Project in association with the Library of Congress. Samuel J. Slocum, we thank you so very much for your service. Thank you, Jay. Welcome home. Thank you very much. It's good to be home. Thank you.